Welcome to today's webinar. The topic is Victory Gardens in World War I and World War II, a growing endeavor. So we're going to start with some key terms that I will be using frequently through the discussion. And then uh, we'll move on into talking about Victory Gardens. So some of the key terms are community gardens, which are gardens that are hosted by a community. Sometimes they're in parks, sometimes they're on vacant lots. Conservation, which is the insightful and careful use of resources so that we're not wasting things. Food production is growing food and um, isolationism is a policy decision that was made in the early 21st century to focus on the United States as opposed to the larger world at large. Lend-Lease was uh, a um, mechanism by which Congress approved to send materials to other countries without actively becoming involved in the war as a combatant. Nationalism is a um, idea that your country matters most and was part of the rise um, to some of the problems that the very con various countries that were involved in World War I and World War II experienced during the wars. Rationing is when the government actually said you can only have so much of some resource. So some of the resources that were rationed were things like sugar, oil, gas, things that were necessary to the, the country's economic uh, ability. Um, and so because we were sending so much overseas to support the military, once we became a combatant, though those conservation of resources became more and more important. And then the last term is supply lines. Supply lines are the route and distance and time it takes to get something from uh, your, your home base or country to the front where think people were fighting. So let's start with World War I. During World War I, the first few years of the war, the Mer United States of America was not a combatant. We didn't join the war until 1917. But from 1914 through the time we joined the war, we were participating in Lend-Lease and sending uh, merchant convoys to England and France. And those convoys were attacked uh, frequently on the Atlantic by submarines. The submarines were first actively used during World War I. They became much more, they saw much more use in World War II, but um, the supply lines between the United States and Europe were long and it was, you had to cross the Atlantic Ocean where you didn't necessarily know um, where the enemy was. So there are several garden commissions that were started. The first, one of the, the early ones was the United States School Garden Army, where students in schools were encouraged to garden at their schools as part of their science classroom work. The other garden commission was the National War Garden Commission. It was organized by Charles Lathrop Pack in March, 1917. This is about the time that we, the United States became an active combatant in the war. Food production had fallen dramatically during the early years of World War I, especially in Europe because of the fighting. So they encouraged Americans to grow vegetable gardens. They also encouraged Americans to also practice conservation of resources. Who was Charles Lathrop Pack? Charles Lathrop Pack was a businessman. His family had made their um, 
fortune in forestry, banking, and real estate. He lived in Cleveland, Ohio, which was where the National War Garden Commission operated out of. He was one of the five wealthiest men in America prior to World War I. In March 1917, he organized the U.S. National War Garden Commission. Here are some posters of the National War Garden Commission. And so this one is from March 1917, and it talks about Garden Rally Week. So when you're gardening, the early part of the year between March and April, depending on which zone you're in, uh, depends on where when you actually start planting your crops outside. And because a lot of people didn't know how to plant crops because we'd become much more industrial based in the North, there was a lot of education on when to plant, how to plant, what to plant. So this poster is from New Hampshire and they're actually encouraging the residents of the state of New Hampshire to be, uh, self-supporting and use less produce from outside of the state. And they had set up local food committees in conjunction with other government agencies and groups to do that. The second poster is similar, but it is for Washington, DC. Each, each area of the country, whether it was local or regional or state had their own commissions that would report up. So this is uh, from the National Archives. It is a photograph with information from war garden activities that occurred in a New Jersey school. And as you can see, the, the students all have their equipment and they're, they lined up for this photo. So, it was not just the National War Garden Commission. There were other groups involved in encouraging people to plant victory gardens and grow their own vegetables and conserve resources and participate in food production for the country. So the Be Patriotic poster is from the US Food Administration. They printed a lot of posters, which they distributed across the country. They actually printed out recipes on postcards. And one of the ones that we have in the collection is things that you can use cottage cheese for as a substitute for meat or other dairy products. This other one is um, sows the seeds of victory and it compares every garden to a munitions plant. So if you think of your, country is building munitions and sending those overseas. At the same time, they have to send food for their the US soldiers, as well as for the soldiers of the countries we were allied with, um, because they weren't able to grow as much food as they needed because they were busy fighting and the men were off at the front. The person depicted in each of these posters is called Columbia. And she is um, like Uncle Sam, is one of the personifications of the United States. So, war gardens and rationing. Encouraging people to grow food and have a war garden was not enough. We just, there was just not enough that we, we were doing, we were slow to start gardening uh, as a, social solution to the various problems we were experiencing having joined the war. So um, it wasn't just enough to grow your own food, but there also started to be a huge uh, public um, relations campaign to conserve more and do more with less. So. The first poster is from the Museum and Libraries collection on joining a home garden club with directions on how to do that. And the second poster, this is what God gives us, is encouraging people to 
eat less wheat, meat, fats, and sugars that we can send those to Europe. The idea behind all of this was that if we could produce enough food, that food would help win the war. So um, people across the country were encouraged to observe meatless days and wheatless days and porkless days and to carry out all the conservation rules of the US Food Administration. And so now I'm going to switch to this camera over here and show you some salad cookbooks from World War I. This first one is a new calendar of salads. It was published in 1915 by the Volan Press. And it is actually a calendar with a different salad instructions for every day of the week. With the idea being that uh, you could have a different salad based on things that you were growing out of your garden And there's no duplicates and there's no, there's not a lot of pictures in these calendar salads. They are just brief instructions on how to make a simple fancy salad with the idea that you would make the salads and eat less wheat, meat, pork, um, and wheat. So the second one is also from the Volan Press. And it is for 1916. And again, it, it shows different salads that are mostly vegetables that you can make at home easily. So those are those cookbooks. So the Volan Press um, actually was a children's pub publisher and greeting card publisher. And they went into cookbooks um, and other books later in uh, their history. But interesting enough, they actually had their offices here in the Monroe building, which now houses the museum and library. Moving on, after World War I, we still needed to continue to home garden there there just wasn't enough food being grown in Europe and we were exporting a lot of the food we were growing in the United States to Europe so we there was posters that came out again featuring Colombia as uh, the United States encouraging people to home can and home dry um, produce so that way we could win the next war now so that we wouldn't be in a position where there was scarcity of resources that we had enough that we could send them to Europe. And so the, the government had pledged to send a certain amount, 20 million tons to Europe. Um, and so they asked the public again to waste nothing and try to do as much as they could to fulfill this pledge. So during the period between 1920 and 1939, nationalism began to um, spread across Europe and in the United States. And so after a while, we began to find ourselves again at war. World War I was thought to be the world, the war to end all wars. And because of the economic environment partially caused by reparations from World War I, World War II happened. And so we're, the government again went back and encouraged people to grow your own. So here are some more posters encouraging people to return to the idea of the Victory Garden. The 
first one, your victory garden counts more than ever. And again, asking people to grow vegetables. Grow it yourself, plant a farm garden now. Again, asking people to convert from floral gardens to vegetable gardens. It wasn't just posters, uh, newspaper cartoons like this one by Bill Malden encouraged people to produce uh, food and help win the war. So uh, this one says you can make this kind of ammunition and it shows a carrot, a beet, and a rutabaga uh, dropping down onto a, a German swastika. The other poster here is um, from the Museum and Libraries collection, and it's do with less so they'll have enough. And he, he sh it shows a, a soldier drinking a cup of coffee. Um, coffee was one of the items that was heavily rationed in the United States during World War II, as was sugar. Here are some photos of community gardens in World War II. These photos are from the National Archives collection. So why is this important today? With climate change disruptions, pandemic related disruptions, and wars overseas, supply chain delays are an issue. Sometimes you can't find your favorite food at your local grocery store. For example, uh, the drought in California currently means that there will not be enough tomatoes in 2023 for canned tomato products. And they are encouraging people to, again, grow tomatoes in your home garden or community garden or school garden. We have some historical books on war gardens. And so I have a few of them here. One is Sowing the Seeds of Victory. American Gardening Programs of World War One. So this is Sowing the Seeds of Victory. And this volume actually is available for interlibrary loan, so you could check it out from us. There's the back side. Another um book that we have in the collection, and this is rare. After World War I, Charles Lathrop Pack actually uh, wrote about how the, the National War Garden Commission was successful in, it's called The War Garden Victorious. And so this volume is rare. It is available for use only in the museum and library. but it shows some of the, the posters that the War Garden Commission has beautiful photographs. Even skyscrapers got into uh, using their rooftops as war gardens. Here's some students. So these are Achievement Club girls. We do have a number of books that you can borrow through Interlibrary Loan. You can also find similar titles at your local public or school library on the basics of gardening. Okay. So the next slide is resources that we have, um, books on gardening today. Okay, some other resources. So Seed Savers is an American nonprofit that supports diversity by encouraging the preservation of heirloom vegetables and flower varietals. These would be the kinds of seeds that were used during World War I and World War II and have been saved for their diversity. They will give their seeds away to gardening groups and schools 
and you can actually apply at that link. GrowSeed is a similar organization in the United Kingdom that will send free seeds to schools. Other resources, public libraries in the United States. Some larger public libraries have what they call seed libraries, where you can actually check out a packet of seeds and use them in your garden, or whether it's your home garden, your school garden, or a community garden. And I have given some examples of larger libraries that have seed gardens, uh, seed libraries that you can check out. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me here at the Museum and Library. Again, my name is Terry Embry, and we look forward to hearing from you, and we will try to uh, post these resources for you on our education page. Well, thank you for joining us today at the Museum and Library's uh, presentation on Victory Gardens, and we hope you'll join us again next time for our next webinar.